Gautimam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tatojeho Diriyat Nashta Priyashu Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevya Bhagavati Uttama Shoki Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki Nigama Kapadura Garitam Param Shuka Mukaram Rita Jovi Samitam Pipata Bhagavatam Rasha Mara Mahara Bhagavan Vishnu, Mangalam Guru Dajaja, Mangalam Padari Kaksho, Mangalaya Tanavari. Om Naraya Raya Bid Mehe, Vasadeva Yadi Mehe, Tano Vishnu Pachodi Atehe. Om Mahadevi Chibidnihi, Vishnu Padni Jidi Mehe, Tano Lakshmi Pachodi Atehe. Mahadakshmi Namastubyam Namastubyam Sade Sade Hade Pare Namastubyam Namastubyam Vyadari. Tapti Kanchana Govarangi Rade Vindavanishari. Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Arivari. Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shimari Bhakti Paranja Shami Dharmani Namaste Sari Sati Devi Guru Mari Pacharini Nirvishes and Yuvari Paskata Desanani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhattari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari <coughs> Thanks for joining Rob on Zoom Brent Jean John Malik Govinda Dave, top of the morning to all of you. As you recall, we skipped last Tuesday and Wednesday because I had a eye surgery, a cataract surgery that took place in Salt Lake City on mid-morning Tuesday. I had had the left eye done about two years ago and went like a dream. I, I woke up the next morning and I could see like a 20-year-old. Everything was crystal clear, reading the bottom of the chart, the letters on the bottom of the art chart looked like they were written on the side of a barn. <laughs> That's how amazing the eye surgery was. It went without a flaw, hardly pain, hardly any pain, hardly any discomfort, immediate thousand percent improvement of my vision. Now that was then, this is now. I, I think my problem was I went in overconfident I went in expecting the same. Now, doctors have a saying to cover this. They say the eyes are not twins, they're siblings. And they mean to say by that, that all eyes don't, just because the left eye reacted in a certain way, doesn't mean the right eye is going to have the same reaction. So if anything could have gone wrong, it did. <clears throat> The uh, surgery, I don't know, it was extremely uncomfortable. Maybe the anesthesia wasn't taking hold. Um, it might have been partly my fault. I was trying to keep my head as steady as I could, but I couldn't help but my feet and ankles squirming. And um, I was discharged. I have to admit to almost, I have to admit to almost committing a crime after having anesthesia, you're not supposed to drive or walk or even take an Uber. <clears throat> My car was parked there at the place in Salt Lake City, and I had a overnight location with virtually within walking distance. But they 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 wouldn't let me walk. They asked me when someone was coming to pick me up, and I don't wouldn't want Bye Bobby to come all the way from Spanish Fork and back just to take me half a mile to a place where I was spending the night. So I kind of fibbed and said, my ride is coming. I waited in the lobby and I was waiting until the lady left the lobby when I could sneak out. She finally took a break. She left. So I'm probably admitting to a crime, but the crime never occurred. So the police don't have, shouldn't, are not going to come breaking the door down and hauling away in handcuffs. I had intended on committing a crime, but I was thwarted because 
No sooner had I crept out and got into my car and started the motor than like three people from the building, some or other, they came out and said, you can't drive now. You can't drive now. <laughs> so I was caught red-handed in the, not in the commission of a crime, but very close to it, on the precipice of it. <laughs> and apparently there are very severe consequences for them also. I was not only... Um, putting myself at risk, maybe a DUI, I don't know. Although I wasn't disoriented at all, really. I was perfectly lucid and in, in command, but they also incur liability. And so with a contrite heart, I walked back into the lobby and they drove me, they, they drove me. And, and then they were kind enough. There was a huge snowstorm overnight. I mean, a, a huge snowstorm, it was like 14 inches of snow. So um, one of the guys there, Joe, um, came in his four-wheel drive pickup and picked me up for the post-op examination the following day. Made it through drifts and drifts of snow. Great guys there. Um, so in the meet, so, so wait a minute, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm skipping ahead. I went back to the residence and went blind. Literally, I went blind in that eye. Couldn't see, couldn't see my hand in front of my face. If I covered this eye, I couldn't see this eye. So I called the place again, said, hey, is this normal? It certainly didn't happen two years ago. When the left eye was done. They said, no, we better get you back in. So even though there's a huge snowstorm coming in, they kept some of the staff back and did a late afternoon repeat surgery on me. Apparently they had not gotten all of the cataract. There was some part of the cataract still there and the eye was reacting to that loose floating substance by literally shutting down. So again, the anesthesia, again, the eye drops, again, the surgery. Actually, it wasn't uh, an anesthesia through the veins. They did all the anesthesia locally with the uh, eye drops. And they claim to have gotten the um, the rest of the cataract out. But so the vision came back, but it's still blurry. Not even as good probably as it was before the surgery. And my eye was totally red. It hit a vein and there was a lot of blood. And I, think, I don't know if it's still, it's clearing up somewhat. Anyway, it was a series of adventures, I tell you. <laughs> Got a follow appointment on Wednesday. Um, I'll, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm waiting to see if the blurriness recedes and my vision improves. In other words, if if there had been any successful outcome from the surgery itself or whether the status quo after all that aggravation and inconvenience <laughs> was go is going to be worth it. Anyway, I stand before you guilty of trying to sneak away Supposedly under the influence, although I don't know, I think I was pretty, I don't think I was disoriented at all. It wasn't the kind of anesthesia where you go to sleep or anything. It was just a very mild. Anyway, condemn me if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so last Monday we had a session in which we talked about the purity of Mars Ambaricious heart. It said that happiness doesn't come from without. It's not something from outside that comes in. It's something from inside that comes out. Happiness is a condition of the heart. <clears throat> Purity of the heart brings two things. It brings happiness, and it also brings God. <clears throat> God is attracted to those of a pure heart. We talked <clears throat> last Monday about keeping your heart clean, again, and nice and clean. Ambarish Marsh was so accommodating in the way that he received Dharmasa Muni. Even though Dharmasa Muni was out of control, he was off the map. He way overacted to a perceived insult on the part of Ambarish. It was not actually an insult at all. Rather, it was Marj Ambarish bending over backwards to accommodate his guest, to finish his vow and accommodate his guests. Yet, Ambarish was, I mean, Dervasa was way over the top, way over the top. And yet Ambarish had such a purity of the heart that 
not only did he not blame Darasa Muni for losing control of his temper and trying to kill him for no reason at all, but he didn't even take offense. He didn't even take, he had, he had no false ego. He had none of the dirt of false ego in the heart. He had real ego, which is that Nitya Sarupa, hi, Krishna Das, I'm eternal servant of Krishna. And as an eternal servant of Krishna, I don't retaliate. I don't take umbrance. I don't take offense. I take everything from the perspective that Krishna is the remote cause. Sure, the immediate cause of the danger in which Ambarish was placed. The immediate cause was Durvasa and his out-of-control anger. But devotees, those who see themselves, are deeply embedded within their consciousness, the identification that they are servants of Krishna, see everything is coming from Krishna. Ambarish not only did not take offense, he didn't even see offense. He accepted whatever criticism Dervasa Muni leveled towards him as coming directly from Krishna. He took it very seriously. And when Dervasa came back to him asking forgiveness, in essence, somebody said, there's nothing to forgive you for. I don't see that you did an offense in the first place. But this level of purity of the heart, lacking lust, envy, greed, false ego. It comes about through personal decisions each and every day, repeatedly, over and over and over again. We have to make decisions. Which book to read, which people to go to lunch with, what to watch on the TV, what movies, how we're going to spend our time, what we're going to eat. Her, Many, many opportunities each and every day to make a God-centered decision or to make a self-centered decision. And the heroes of faith are those who for a very long time have made decisions which consistently honor God. Is the reading of this book going to honor God? Is the seeing of this movie going to honor God? Are, are the hanging around these people going to honor God? Is listening to this music honor God? Am I going to spend this money in such a way as to honor God? Yad karosi, yad ishnasi, yad ishnasi tapasi, tad karusham and arpana. Krishna says, everything that you do, everything that you offer, all the charity that you give, the gifts that you give, offer them as a loving offering to me. You've probably heard me several times before with this ditty. The perfect example of one who offered everything to the Lord is Hanuman. Hanuman Ji, son of the wind, Lord of the monkeys, Rama's best friend. You eliminate illusion, destroy all sin. You're known as Shiva's incarnation. I'm practicing every day now because the Festival of Colors is only a month away and I plan on bringing out, bringing out all these lyrics, sharing them with the young crowd. And I've even got... Um, to Krishanto, Santa Ana, DJ. He's coming with Bali to be part of Bali's hip hop rock song, but we're kind of working also to coordinate him backing me up with music. So I'm taking every opportunity to practice, and I hope you don't mind if I practice this in front of you, rub some of the dust off the mirror of my remembrance. Hanuman Ji, son of the wind, lord of the monkeys, Rama's best friend, you eliminate illusion, destroy all sin, and you're known as Shiva's incarnation. Champ in a truth of the thunderbolt body, the mighty monkey god who embodies bhakti. You're the breath of Shakti, you achieve victory like the movie Rocky. You carry a club and smash a thug because you're the perfect servant, the face of grace, and your heart is pure. This is what we're talking about. Perfect servant, the face of grace, and your heart is pure. You make the whole demon race tremble when you roar. Your compassion and action, devotion and emotion, with the strength to leap the length of the ocean. Hanuman G, you have the power. Make yourself small as a cat, tall as a tower. You devour lust, ignorance, envy, and greed. You succeed and never cower in the hour of need. You left a Lanka to reassure Sita. Don't worry about a thing because Rama is going to free you. You burned down Lanka when your tail was on fire and to serve Lord Rama is your only desire. When Rama's little brother was about to die without a second thought, you began to fly. 
searching for a cure high in the Himalayas. And when you weren't sure which herb to take them, homie, you brought the whole mountain back with one hand. That's why Hanuman, you're Rama's best friend. You embody bhakti yoga of love. That's why Ram gives you a great big old hug. You're the mighty monkey warrior of the epic Ramayana, repeating Ram's name's a holy Ram Nam, singing kirtan with the symbols in your hand going on and on like a one-man band, singing Jai Ram, Si Ram, Jai Jai Ram, rocking on and on until the break of dawn. Singing Jai Ram, Si Ram, Jai Jai Ram, rocking on and on until the break of dawn. And then, in addition, time permitting, I tacked on this poem by Francis Havergal. You've heard me say before that of all the Christian poets, the one that has tapped into pure unalloyed devotion, which we call bhakti, the most, I believe, is Francis Havergal. Listen to this and tell me if you don't think that this is all about purity of heart, all about happiness being a heart condition. Imagine the state of the heart, which makes a prayer like this. And we can easily imagine Hanuman praying with these words to Lord Ram. Ram, take my life and let it be consecrated to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let it sing always only for my king. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, and I will be ever only all for thee. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you purity of heart as exemplified by Bajaran Bali, the great and powerful monkey devotee of the Lord. Without this purity, without this willingness to be used as an instrument, one must be willing to let the super soul from within the heart, the Lord of the heart, take over one's own senses, one's own thinking, one's own feeling, and one's own willing. Hanuman might also have made this prayer. I'm not sure whether, I don't think this was Francis Habergal. This was uh, some other poet. But we can easily imagine Hanuman praying in this way as well. Long did, Ram, long did I toil and found no earthy rest. Far did I roam and found no certain home. Till at last I sought them in his sheltering breast, who opens his arms and bids the weary come. With him I found a home, a rest divine, and I since them am his and he is mine. The good I have is from Ram's store supplied. The ill is only what Ram deems the best. With Ram as friend, I'm rich with nothing beside and poor without Ram, though of all possessed. Changes may come, I take or I resign, content while I am Ram's and Ram is mine. Changes may come, but in Ram, no change is seen. Ram's like a glorious sun that wanes not nor decline. He walks above the storms and darkness serene and on his devotees inward darkness shines. While here, alas, I know but half Ram's love, but half discern him and but half adore. But when I meet Ram in the realms above, I hope to love him fully, praise him more and show and tell amidst the kirtans divine how fully I am Ram's and Ram is mine. Purity of heart friends, means unmixed motives, means non-duplicitous, means not of two minds, of one mind, and that is to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The intelligence of those who are devoted, who are pure in heart, is single-minded. Eka kuru. Bahu shaka hiyanantascha. On the other hand, the intelligence of those who are fragmented, of those who are not single-minded, of those who are focused on all the shimra 
of the material world, all the world of names. It is said it is many branched. Like you take one piece of glass, you drop it on the floor, shatters into a million pieces. So the consciousness of those who are not integrated in bhakti and devotion, who do not see Krishna as the source of everything, nor as the all-pervading super soul everywhere present, their consciousness is like that glass which has fallen on the floor and shattered in a million, million different pieces. One who is pure in heart is transparent. They don't present themselves one way and in private, in darkness, act another way. What you see is what you get. You get one person. They may not be perfect in every respect, but they are what they are. They don't pretend to be better than they are. They're trying their level best with all of the resources at their command to get the right friends, to think the right thoughts, to speak the right things, to eat the right food, to have the right input, to cultivate the sublimity of spiritual realization in everything that they do day after day after day. And it doesn't work just to have a really, one really good day and then take a vacation for three months. This is an ongoing daily process. Our tendency in this material world is to forget God. Krishna, Baliya, Sejiva. The whole material world is constructed in such a way by Lord Brahma and presided over by Maya, the personality of illusion, in such a way as to make us forget God. You can't just do once and done. It's like you might say to somebody, whew, you stink. Why didn't you take a shower? And then if they were to say, well, I took a shower a year ago. That's all I need. No, you have to, because the atmosphere is dirty. There's dirt particles floating in the atmosphere. You have to take a shower every day. A shower every day. It's not sufficient to have taken a shower a week ago or a year ago. You have to do it every day. So the application of remembrance, the revival of one's dormant Krishna consciousness is an effort that needs to be repeated every single day consistently until such time and even beyond such time as one there's no difference between one's actions and one's motives there's no difference between the outer self and the inner self the flow of everything thoughts words deeds is a, is a downward pull of gravity almost powerful Gravity is the most powerful force in this material world. And similarly, love, love acts like gravity, pulling the living being towards Krishna. If we're a drop of water in a river on top of a mountain, then we want to release ourselves to the downward flow of the river, to the downward pull of gravity. Why? Because that will take us automatically into the greater body of water. The ocean. So we as individual drops of water, we want to merge. We want to become one with the ocean, not non-differentiated. We don't want to lose our individuality, but we want to live in the ocean in our original spiritual forms so that we will have fully awakened our face-to-face -face relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. In the third canto, I believe it's Uddhava explaining that we're meant to live in the greater ocean of the spiritual world. We're meant to go deep into that ocean and not just merge as a drop into the overall body of waters. No, we have our original sarup, our original form, our original personality, which was given to us by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So from that seed and in the nurturing environment of the spiritual atmosphere, we want to again blossom, to evolve our original spiritual seeing, tasting, smelling, and hearing. 
Just like in the ocean, there are Tumingila fish, huge whales, there are man of wars, there's barracudas, there's sharks. They're not in any danger of being ever again separated from the ocean because they have developed their full fledged spiritual forms. But similarly, Kunti prays, let me be, let me give myself over to the pull of love, divine, unlimited, relishable, ever increasing. Let me give myself over. Let me make myself vulnerable. Let me make myself susceptible to the virus of love and thus flow down through the various rivers into the great ocean of the spiritual world. It is stated by Uddhav in the third canto of Bhagavatam that we are meant to live as great aquatics in that water. That is our natural constitutional position to swim here and there in the greater atmosphere of pure Krishna prema, love of God. Every atom, every, every molecule, every particle of dust in the spiritual world exudes, vibrates, resonates with Krishna prema. And we're meant to live in that atmosphere of love. And so Kunti Dev, says, as the Ganges flows down from the Himalayan heights, pulled by the downward force of its own weight and by the power of gravity, and eventually breaks out into the greater expanse of the ocean of Bengal. So let me, a conditioned, limited soul, um, and burdened by a body of flesh and blood and mucus and stool, let my inner self, let my core, resonate with, rise to, and follow the call of Krishna's flute to the effect that I will become free of this material body at the time of dropping this current material body. Not only will I not accept another material body, but I will appear full-fledged, liberated soul in an eternal body in such a way as to engage in reciprocal, eternal, loving relationships with Krishna. Now, we're all meant for that freedom. We're all meant to live without reference to birth, death, disease, and old age. We're meant to bask and submerge ourselves in an ocean of love. Anything less than that, anything less than that, it's like the son of a rich man, the son of a multi-billion dollar a man, who, who has as his heritage uh, the, the legacy of all of the riches that the father has to offer. All, everything that the father has belongs by right to the son. But if that son turns his back on all of that, the education, the tutors, the mansion, the transport, all the opportunities, and goes and lives out of garbage cans on the street, having become addicted to drugs. Is there anything sadder than that? Is there anything more tragic or more pathetic? That having this birthright, it's like a person that has millions and millions of dollars and yet is unaware of them and lives on the street. I told a story not too many weeks ago about a, a man who got six years in prison for armed robbery. What he did was he took an old pistol that had been passed down to him through the family from the Civil War days. And he went into a bank with that pistol and he walked out of the bank with a couple of thousand dollars. Didn't get more than two blocks away before the police arrested him. He went to trial where his sentence turned out to be two years in prison. The interesting thing about it was that when that gun, which was taken out from the evidence room, was presented at trial, it was discovered that this gun was a rare limited edition gun made by the Colt Rifle Company. The gun was worth half a million dollars. This guy, for the sake of getting $2,000, getting 
getting caught and sentenced to six years in prison, he had in his hand an heirloom. It was his without any question. It was there was no there was no challenges. There were no liens against it. It was unquestionably his inheritance, his gun. And yet little did he realize that the gun was worth half a million dollars. It's a sad story. It's a pathetic waste of potentiality. And so Uddhava says, Jiva maham shthara mahataram tahara mahatam bhavirasharam. We are meant to be free of birth, death, disease, and old age. We're meant to be engaged in so sweet, such intimate, loving affairs with Krishna and all of his associates in this transcendentally pure, beautiful, pristine, eternal, spiritual world. There's nothing sadder than our having come to our present condition of being saddled and burdened with material bodies, suffering the conditions of birth, death, disease, and age, and all the limitations. And most sharp of all the different afflictions from which we suffer is the lack of real love in our life. We have a hankering for it. We have a propensity for it. And yet it's not to be found in this material world. What passes for love in this material world is lust. We are attracted one to another because we think that person will satisfy our senses. We're not attracted for the sake of love itself. We're not swept away. We're not in the flow of divine, eternal, selfless love. Just the opposite. We're, we're enamored um, with self-concern, with self-interest. And so what passes is love in this material world is really lust. Kama prema donakara It is said in Chaitanya Charita, kama prema donakara Lust, self-interested, it's like they say, I fell in love at first sight. No, you fell into lust at first sight. Love is something that's cultivated only after many, many years of commitment. You cannot feel love in the beginning of a relationship. Love is as a result of sacrifices. It's as a result of vows taken and followed. And most importantly, love is the byproduct of time. Time. One must come to trust that person. One must build a history with that person. And the fruit of trust and history is love. There is no such thing as love at first sight. What it is, is lust at first sight. And a year later, there's divorce and bitterness and hate, enmity. That is the worst thing from which we suffer in this material world. We all are looking for love. We're made for love. We're created in love. We're, we're conceived in love. And yet it's absent within this material. It's as if you're in the desert, you're parched, you're suffering. And you think you see shimmering water in the distance. So baited by what you think is water, you start running. And what little precious energy that has not been drained out of you by your thirst and by the scorching heat ebbs and ebbs and ebbs. And as you run and run and run, your last bit of energy deserts you. And yet the water seems to get no closer because ladies and gentlemen, there is no water in the desert. It's only a mirage. It's only an illusion. We think we see love. We think it's just over the hill or around the next corner. Or that we think the next person we meet will bring us love or through the wanted ads, or the, the relationship ads, or the marriage ads. And yet, we should know that there is no love in this material world any more than there is water in the desert. Love exists. That's a fact. And it is a fact that we are meant for love, designed for love, created for love. But we're looking for it in the wrong place. That's the problem. Shmerang Bangi Traya Parchitam Sachivishanam Bamsin Rasharam Kucharam Govinda Kyam Hari Tanumisha Keshir Tritapanatyam Apreksis Tabadi Risa Ke Sango Sange Shiranga. It said tongue in cheek, the statement is there. If you if you are attracted to the desert like 
family and friends and country of this material world. If you're if you think those are all in all, family, friends, country, if you think that's all in all, and if you are counting on that to yield you happiness, then the poet says, Shmeran, Shmeran Bangi, Triaparchitam Sachivishanam Vidham, do not look at the son of Mother Yashoda Nandamaraj with a smile on his face, standing in a threefold bending form in the, in the evening on the bank of the Yamuna River, basked in the light of the moon. Whatever you do, do not venture there. Do not lay your eyes. Do not fix your heart upon. Do not hear. Keep your senses from either hearing or seeing or smelling or tasting anything to do with that blackish snake Krishna, because once you're bitten by the beauty, the love, the attractiveness of Krishna, you're never again going to hanker after family, friends, and love. You will see them as no more than a drop of water in the desert. If you're suffering from thirst and around you, there's nothing but scorching sands for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Will you be satisfied with one drop of water on your tongue? It will be inadequate. You need an ocean under that circumstances. You need as much water as you can drink. You need water to drink till your stomach is distorted. You need to shower in water. You need to dive into water and swim into water. One drop's not enough. I remember a couple of summers between semesters in boarding school into Lawrenceville, private boarding school in New Jersey. And I wanted something interesting to do for a summer jobs. So I think after my junior year and my senior year, I spent the summers on a dude ranch in a place called Saddle String, Wyoming, not too far from where I am now, actually, just one state over near Sheridan and Buffalo. And my job was a waiter. There were all kinds of very wealthy people from the East Coast who came. And they ate three meals a day in the dining room. It's our job to serve them out. But wanting a little exercise and some sun, when it was time to um, bring in the hay, uh, we would go out during the afternoon after having served lunch. We would go out to the fields where the hay bells sat and we would take our shirts off so we'd get a lot of sun, a lot of exercise, and we'd throw the hay bales up onto the wagon and stack them and bring them in, stack them into the barn. We weren't paid for this. We just did it as young men with a surfeit of energy. So we would, we would spend all day in the hot sun in Wyoming um, ex exercising our muscles throwing hay bells sometimes up above our own heads onto the thing. And you can imagine you get pretty parched, you get pretty dry. So, and we had water with us, but it just, you know, at the end of a couple, two or three hours of doing that, you wanted something more than, um, you know, your water bottle. You, it certainly, you certainly wouldn't have worked all that time to get a drop of water on your tongue. Certainly wouldn't have been satisfied with that. We did have water that we would drink to get us through those few hours. But the first thing we did when we got back to the ranch, all of us with our shirts off and in our jeans, we would immediately, we would, we, we would say, last guy into the swimming pool zone, you know, whatever. And we would dive into the swimming pool. It, it, only full immersion in the pool would bring us back to a state of normalcy would be adequate for hydrating us after having worked hard in the hot sun for a few hours. So similarly, if, 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 you, if you want to stick to, if you as a thirsty man in the middle of hundreds of miles of desert are going to settle for one drop of water, then the last thing you want to do is look at the smiling face of Govinda as he stands playing his flute in the moonlight of the Yamuna River, because he, that black snake will bite you 
and infect you with the poison of dissatisfaction with the limitedness of condition, life in this world of birth, death, disease, and all age. Another accusation which is leveled at Krishna is that he's a thief. Yes, he will steal all of your affection for mundane, temporary things. It will all be swept up into the flow, the power, the downward pull of love of the individual soul for the supreme soul, our creator, our maintainer, our best friend, Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. The beautiful thing about devotional service, about bhakti under the guidance of a spiritual master is that you're working with many other God brothers, with many other peers. We've been given this great worldwide international society for Krishna consciousness with many temples, many associates, wonderful prasadam, festivals, books, all kinds of services and duties. So all you have to do is get yourself in the middle of what we call ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And that is the means, that is the river, which all you have to do is just let yourself go, give yourself over to the flow of that river of ISKCON, and it will take you along with all of your God brothers and all of your associates and hopefully your family members and your loved ones. It will just automatically take you because of the power an attraction of its flow back to home, back to God. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hey, thanks for those hearts and those thumbs up. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Brent Pranavs, Jean. Thank you, John Malik Haribo, Govinda Dave. Thank you for joining us. Natasha, Tasha and Larry and their kids, I think she had three kids, went to the program in Salt Lake City on Saturday night. And I said, how was it? And they said, it was great. Ishan, the 16 or 17 year old son of Kapil gave a fantastic talk and other family members of his led the kirtans and Govinda Dev, from what I understand, did the Shring Arti. Pradyumna and Ryan, with a couple of impromptu visitors, cooked the feast. They were only informed uh, early in the afternoon that there, there was no one to cook the feast. So they very kindly agreed to come in and cook the feast with no prior notice. And it, to all reports, was one of the most incredible feasts that anybody has ever tasted. Everybody was amazed at the quality of the prasadam. So thanks to Pradyumna Ryan and those who helped you, I think probably uh, Hitesh and others. We get a hundred or so people on a regular basis on Saturday night in Spanish for um, Salt Lake City. I'll be there next Saturday also, I think. So I look forward to experiencing the, the, the great larger community of devotees up there in the metropolitan area. We had our Sunday feast yesterday, probably about 30 people or so. Quite nice, but not on the same scale as Salt Lake City. And we don't have that level of commitment either amongst our attendees. Most people from Utah Valley are students coming for college courses or even personal interest. There are many Mormons that come they're interested to see what we have to offer, but they're not really searching. They're not really anchoring. So we do what we do here and they do what they do in Salt Lake City. And it's it's nice. They're two different tastes, two different experiences. Um, Shali Shirley, she says, I love the lessons you give. I always learn so much. Well, I'm glad. Apparently you've been here with us more than once, but this may have been the first time that you weighed in with a comment. So it's always good to hear from people who are out there. It is inspirational. It's encouraging for me. Dianidi, Dianidi Dasanu Das, please steal away my love for your external energy. What a great prayer. What a great prayer. Hari, the thief who takes away our Love, or shall I say lust, for the external energy. Yes. John Malik says, make an adventure every day. Yes, there's no such thing as a dull, boring day. Every day, you have choices where to go, who to hang out with, what to listen to, 
what to eat, what to read, what to talk about. There's so many choices and you make the right choices, you will live every day as a thrill at every moment. Rob, you have anything to share with us? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Thank you for the class today. Good morning. Thank you. The after long the, list. After the break, I've got I've got energy. I'm I'm charged up. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so the takeaways I have for today is use this bod to honor God. <laughs> <laughs> a heart that's pure is my cure. Yeah. When we live in love, we're pulled to Krishna above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love is stronger than gravity. It will set me spiritually free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And get in the middle to solve life's riddle. I think the muse is smiling on you this morning. <laughs> all right. It's all... All Krishna's grace and your guidance. Thank you. Thank you for those. I can't wait to post everything. And I'm already looking forward to continuing this ecstatic discussion tomorrow. Thanks all of you for being a part of it. Thanks for facilitating it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Ram. Hare Ram. Ram Ram Hare. Oh, one, one postscript, which is not the happiest of news, but it is and it isn't. We were, we, we, many of us, and I know Joshua, who, who is a very serious devotee here in Spanish for, um, had a great, has a great attachment to Kadamba Kana Swami. He came here for the Sadhusang. I believe it was the first time I ever met him. I was immediately taken by his so many qualities. He was my immediate best friend. And yet, shortly after the Sada song, which occurred in May, he sent out a letter to all the devotees, revealing that doctors had diagnosed him with cancer throughout his whole body and given him only a few months to live. And yet, uh, throughout the last few months of his life, he went touring, went revisiting for one last time South Africa. And, originally from the Netherlands, visiting and doing kirtan, never, never any self-pity, never feeling sorry for himself, never anything but a smile and encouragement for all the devotees. It was never about him. It was always about how he could help other people. So now apparently he's in Vrindavan and um, he's in his last days, only taking water. He's incapable, his body is incapable of processing food at the present moment, but he's surrounded by many devotees. His, his sannyas guru, Jayadvaita Maharaj, is uh, reading to him from the Krishna books. And again, even, even now, he's a smile on his face. Um, what, what can I do for others? I'm so happy to be part of an international society in, in which such people are leaders and shining examples. And I believe that you know, if there was one person we would like to stay for another 20 or 30 years to spread the joy, it would be Kadambakana Swami. And yet Krishna has his ways. He's taking him away. Just, just as I was getting to know him, he's just when I gained him, I lost him, lost him. And even those with a long-term relationship, I imagine would just want more and more and more and more and more of the same. But he's going to be there in the spiritual world, and he's just one more reason why we should chance a glance at that smiling boy bathed in the moonlight on the banks of the Yamuna River. He's just one more reason why we should put ourselves in such a vulnerable position that that snake of Krishna bites us with love of God, that that thief Krishna takes away all of our money and attracts him because Kadamba Gatshana Swami being in the spiritual world is one more really good reason why we should also become pure, conscientious, diligent practitioners of devotional service, finish up our time in this material world and go back to home, back to Godhead, ASAP. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.